Hello? Hi. Yes, they've gone. We've we've had to switch microphones out here. It's fantastic. And uh, this uh, other in engineer came out. We have a whole new set of microphones, condensers. Par Price is wired in here. He looks, he looks like something dropped <laughs> dropped from outer space. <laughs> the place is just surrounded with electronic equipment. We have four microphones, stands, uh, amplifiers, speakers, and wires all over the place. I mean, it looks like all we need is like a body to cut up and bring back to life. It's like a Frankenstein monster. It's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they left you about 15 minutes ago. We're afraid they're going to come back and bring more of this stuff. Okay. Bye-bye. This is a chapter from my novel, Trout Fishing in America. The chapter is called The Hunchback Trout. The creek was made narrow by little green trees that grew too close together. The creek was like 12,845 telephone booths in a row with high Victorian ceilings and all the doors taken off and all the backs of the booths knocked out. Sometimes when I went fishing in there, I felt just like a telephone repairman, even though I did not look like one. I was only a kid covered with fishing tackle. But in some strange way, by going in there and catching a few trout, I kept the telephones in service. I was an asset to society. It was pleasant work, but at times it made me uneasy. It could grow dark in there instantly when there were some clouds in the sky and they worked their way onto the sun. Then you almost needed candles to fish by and foxfire in your reflexes. Once I was in there when it started raining, it was dark and hot and steamy. I was, of course, on overtime. I had that going in my favor. I caught seven trout in 15 minutes. The trout in those telephone booths were good fellows. There were a lot of young cutthroat trout six to nine inches long, perfect pen size for local calls. Sometimes there were a few fellows, 11 inches or so, for the long distance calls. I've always liked cutthroat trout. They put up a good fight, running against the bottom and then broad jumping. Under their throats they fly the orange banner of Jack the Ripper. Also in the creek were a few stubborn rainbow trout, seldom heard from, but they're all the same, like certified public accountants. I'd catch one every once in a while. They were fat and chunky, almost as wide as they were long. I've heard those trout called squire trout. It used to take me about an hour to hitchhike to that creek. There was a river nearby. The river wasn't much. The creek was where I punched in. Leaving my cart above the clock, I'd punch out again when it was time to go home. I remember the afternoon I caught the hunchback trout. A farmer gave me a ride in a truck. He picked me up at a traffic signal beside a bean field, and he never said a word to me. His stopping and picking me up and driving me down the road was as automatic a thing to him as closing the barn door. Nothing need be said about it. But still I was in motion, traveling 35 miles an hour down the road, watching houses and groves of trees go by, watching chickens and mailboxes enter and pass through my vision. Then I did not see any houses for a while. This is where I get out, I said. The farmer nodded. The truck stopped. Thanks a lot, I said. The farmer did not ruin his audition for the Metropolitan Opera by making a sound. He just nodded his head again. The truck started up. He was the original silent old farmer. A little while later, I was punching in at the creek. I put my card above the clock and went into that long tunnel of telephone booths. I waited about 73 telephone booths in. I caught two trout in a little hole that was like a wagon wheel. It was one of my favorite holes and always good for a trout or two. I always like to think of that hole as a kind of pencil sharpener. I put my reflexes in, and they came back out with a good point on them. Over a period of a couple of years, I must have caught 50 trout in that hole, though it was only as big as a wagon wheel. I was fishing with salmon eggs and using a size 14 single egg hook on a pound and a quarter test tippet. The two trout lay in my creel covered entirely by green ferns, ferns made gentle and fragile by the damp walls of telephone booths. 
The next good place was 45 telephone booths in. The place was at the end of a run of gravel, brown and slippery with algae. The run of gravel dropped off and disappeared at a little shelf where there were some white rocks. One of the rocks was kind of strange. It was a flat white rock. Off by itself from the other rocks, it reminded me of a cat I had seen in my childhood. The cat had fallen or been thrown off a high wooden sidewalk that went along the side of a hill in Tacoma, Washington. The cat was lying in a parking lot below. The fall had not appreciably helped the thickness of the cat, and then a few people had parked their cars on the cat. Of course, that was a long time ago, and the cars looked different from the way they look now. You hardly see those cars anymore. They are the old cars. They have to get off the highway because they can't keep up. That flat white rock off by itself from the other rocks reminded me of that dead cat come to lie there in the creek among 12,845 telephone booths. I threw out a salmon egg and let it drift down over that rock and wham, a good hit, and I had the fish on and it ran hard downstream, cutting at an angle and staying deep and really coming on hard, solid and uncompromising, and then the fish jumped and for a second I thought it was a frog. I had never seen a fish like that before. God damn, what the hell? The fish ran deep again and I could feel its life energy screaming back up the line to my hand. The line felt like sound. It was like an ambulance siren coming straight at me, red light flashing and then going away again and then taking to the air and becoming an air raid siren. The fish jumped a few more times and it still looked like a frog, but it didn't have any legs. Then the fish grew tired and sloppy and I swung and splashed it up the surface of the creek and into my net. The fish was a 12-inch rainbow trout with a huge hump on its back, a hunchback trout, the first I'd ever seen. The hump was probably due to an injury that occurred when the trout was young. Maybe a horse stepped on it, or a tree fell over in a storm, or its mother spawned where they were building a bridge. There was a fine thing about that trout. I only wish I could have made a death mask of him, not of his body, though, but of his energy. I don't know if anyone would have understood his body. I put it in my creel. Later in the afternoon, when the telephone boos began to grow dark at the edges, I punched out of the creek and went home. I had that hunchback trout for dinner, wrapped in cornmeal and fried in butter. Its hump tasted sweet as the kisses of Esmeralda. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Oh, love poem. It's so nice. To wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody that you love them when you don't love them anymore. <sighs> love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. It's so nice to wake, wake up, up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. 
It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem? It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore? This is KSAN Metro Media Stereo 95, San Francisco, Oakland. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Poema de amor. Es tan bello despertarse en la mañana solo, sin tener que decirle a alguien que le amo cuando ya no le amo. Love poem. <clears throat> it's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. Love poem. It's so nice to wake up in the morning all alone and not have to tell somebody you love them when you don't love them anymore. This is a chapter from my novel, A Confederate General from Big Sur. The chapter is called The Rivets in Ecclesiastes. I went up to my cabin. I could hear the ocean below banging against the rocks. I passed the garden. It was covered with fish nets to keep the birds off. As usual, I stumbled over the motorcycle that was beside my bed. The motorcycle was one of Lee Mellon's pets. It was lying there in about 45 parts. A couple of times every week, Lee Mellon would say, I think I'll put my motorcycle together. It's a $400 motorcycle. He always said that it was a $400 motorcycle, but nothing ever came of it. I lit the lantern and was enclosed within the glass walls of the cabin. My place was furnished like all the other cabins down there. I did not have a table, any chairs, or a bed. I slept on the floor in a sleeping bag and used two white rocks for bookends. I used the engine block of the motorcycle to set the lantern on so I could raise the light to make reading a little more comfortable. The cabin had a very crude wood stove. Lee Mellon's creation that could warm the place up instantly on a cold night, but the moment you did not put another piece of wood in the stove, the cabin would be plunged right back into the cold. I was, of course, reading Ecclesiastes at night in a very old Bible that had heavy pages. At first I read it over and over again every night, and then I read it once every night, and then I began reading just a few verses every night, and now I was just looking at the punctuation marks. Actually, I was counting them, a chapter every night. I was putting the number of punctuation marks down in a notebook in neat columns. I called the notebook The Punctuation Marks in Ecclesiastes. I thought it was a nice title. I was doing it as a kind of study in engineering. Certainly, before they build a ship, they know how many rivets it takes to hold the ship together and the various sizes of the rivets. I was curious about the number of rivets and the sizes of those rivets in Ecclesiastes, a dark and beautiful ship sailing on our waters. A summary of my little columns would go something like this. The first chapter of Ecclesiastes has 57 punctuation marks and they are broken down into 22 commas, eight semicolons, eight colons, two question marks, and 17 periods. 
The second chapter of Ecclesiastes has 103 punctuation marks, and they are broken down into 45 commas, 12 semicolons, 15 colons, 6 question marks, and 25 periods. The third chapter of Ecclesiastes has 77 punctuation marks, and they are broken down into 33 commas, 21 semicolons, 8 colons, 3 question marks, and 12 periods. The fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes has 58 punctuation marks, and they are broken down into 25 commas, 9 semicolons, 5 colons, 2 question marks, and 17 periods. The fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes has 67 punctuation marks, and they are broken down into 25 commas, 7 semicolons, 15 colons, 3 question marks, and 17 periods. And this is what I was doing by lantern light at Big Sur, and I gained a pleasure and an appreciation by doing this. Personally, I think the Bible gains by reading it with a lantern. I do not think the Bible has ever truly adjusted to electricity. By lantern light, the Bible shows its best. I counted the punctuation marks in Ecclesiastes very carefully so as not to make a mistake, and then I blew the lantern out. <sighs> Here are the sounds of my life in San Francisco. Hungry? Damn right. Uh, I don't know really what I'd like to have to eat. I could, you know, we can get some steaks over at Safeway and bring uh, it back here and you like mushroom oh, and steaks. Oh man, and, that sound good. And, and then we can uh, throw a little salad together too, huh? That, I'd like that. I'd I like uh, for some fresh salad and, uh, and steak and uh, Maybe a nice vegetable. A vegetable, yeah. We could have some corn or something. Yeah, or that would whatever, be whatever, whatever, whatever is good. That would really, yeah. yeah. That really sounds good. I need something fresh. I'm hungry too. All right. Hey, I know what we could do too. We could do something radical. I know it would probably uh, create some strange. Give it mystic. a try. Let, let's see. <laughs> what is it? Strange mystic vibrations in your uh, kitchen. We could get a pound of real coffee and I could make brew up some... Real food. coffee in my kitchen? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, what will I do with the instant coffee? <laughs> <laughs> oh, your days will settle back now. <laughs> <laughs> real coffee? Yeah, we could get some real, regular grind uh, speed. Aha, garlic salt. That's the stuff we're... There is no substitute under the sun. For garlic, okay, I'm sorry. I, I, no, garlic well, salt is all right. But it, it has bears the same relation to garlic that, that uh, instant coffee bears to coffee. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, see, I used to make regular coffee all the time. Well, I don't know what happened to you, Ray Richard. Well, I, I don't think you have that. You can provide yourself with any kind of excuse. <laughs> It's these, it's, it's these years of, uh, of bachelorhood that I've done it because, well, well one, no, this is one thing that's happened. Uh, I used to make it, uh, Just I, used to, I used to drink a lot more coffee. I used to drink like four or six cups of coffee. Yeah, you don't drink much coffee. Yeah, anymore. yeah, now I drink that's the whole thing. thing. Two cups of coffee is where I take in the morning and I take one late in the afternoon. And you don't even care about coffee yeah, anymore. Yeah. terrible. He's unable. He's probably during his lifetime he's made maybe five, ten thousand cups of coffee. He's unable to make a good cup of coffee. So you're telling us not about his good coffee. Or is that just price? That's price. He talks about that good coffee. But a, a drop of it has never seen this world. It's always the same. Powerful, strong, bitter, black. Always the same. Year after year after year passes, and his coffee always remains undrinkable. I get a certain amount of amusement watching people attempt to drink it like people have never seen it for the first time. You know? It's really, it's really a, a virgin experience to watch somebody who's never had Price's coffee. Price, would you like some coffee? And they say, yeah. And he, and he pours out some, some of his coffee for them. Does he drink it? Oh, he loves it, man. His stomach must be, must be like inside of a, I don't know what, a safe?
This is a group of poems from my book, The Pill vs. the Spring Hill Mine Disaster. The first poem is called, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. I like to think, and the sooner the better, of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think, Right now, please, of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deer stole peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think it has to be of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and joined back to nature, returned to our mammal brothers and sisters and all watched over by machines of loving grace. December 30th. At 1.03 in the morning, a fart smells like a marriage between an avocado and a fish head. I have to get out of bed to write this down without my glasses on. A boat. Oh, beautiful was the werewolf in his evil forest. We took him to the carnival and he started crying when he saw the Ferris wheel. Electric green and red tears flow down his furry cheeks. He looked like a boat out on the dark water. Haiku Ambulance. A piece of green pepper fell off the wooden salad bowl. So what? Death is a beautiful car parked only for Emmett. Death is a beautiful car, parked only to be stolen on a street lined with trees whose branches are like the intestines of an emerald. You hotwire death, get in and drive away like a flag made from a thousand burning funeral parlors. You have stolen death because you're bored. There's nothing good playing at the movies in San Francisco. You joyride around for a while, listening to the radio, and then abandon death. Walk away and leave death for the police to find. Karma Repair Kit, items one to four. One, get enough food to eat and eat it. Two, find a place to sleep where it is quiet and sleep there. Three, reduce intellectual and emotional noise until you arrive at the silence of yourself and listen to it. Four, the next poem is called Crab Cigar. I was watching a lot of crabs eating in the tide pools of the Pacific a few days ago. When I say a lot, I mean hundreds of crabs. They eat like cigars. Widow's Lament. It's not quite cold enough to go borrow some firewood from the neighbors. The Pumpkin Tide. I saw thousands of pumpkins last night come floating in on the tide, bumping up against the rocks and rolling up on the beaches. It must be Halloween in the sea. Man. With his hat on, he's about five inches taller than a taxi cab. Adrenaline Mother. Adrenaline Mother with your dress of comets and shoes of swift bird wings and shadow of jumping fish. Thank you for touching, understanding, and loving my life. Without you, I am dead. San Francisco. This poem was found written on a paper bag by Richard Brodigan in a laundromat in San Francisco. The author is unknown. By accident, you put your money in my machine, number four. By accident, I put my money in another machine, number six. On purpose, I put your clothes in the empty machine full of water and no clothes. It was lonely. 1942. Piano tree, play in the dark concert halls of my uncle, 26 years old, dead and homeward bound on a ship from Sitka. His coffin travels like the fingers of Beethoven over a glass of wine. Piano tree, play in the dark concert halls of my uncle, a legend of my childhood, dead, they send him back to Tacoma. 
At night, his coffin travels like the birds that fly beneath the sea, never touching the sky. Piano tree, play in the dark concert halls of my uncle, take his heart for a lover and take his death for a bed and send him homeward bound on a ship from Sitka to bury him where I was born. At the California Institute of Technology, I don't care how goddamn smart these guys are, I'm bored. It's been raining like hell all day long and there's nothing to do. Written January 24th, 1967, while poet in residence at the California Institute of Technology. Xerox candy bar. Ah, you're just a copy of all the candy bars I've ever eaten. Alas, measured perfectly. Saturday, August 25th, 1888, 5.20 p.m. is the name of a photograph of two old women in a front yard beside a white house. One of the women is sitting in a chair with a dog in her lap. The other woman is looking at some flowers. Perhaps the women are happy, but then it is Saturday, August 25th, 1888, 5.21 p.m. and all over. This is a short story called Revenge of the Lawn. My grandmother, in her own way, shines like a beacon down the stormy American past. She was a bootlegger in a little county up in the state of Washington. She was also a handsome woman, close to six feet tall, who carried 190 pounds in the grand operatic manner of the early 1900s. And her specialty was bourbon, a little raw, but a welcomed refreshment in those Volstead Act days. She, of course, was no female Al Capone, but her bootlegging feats were the cornucopia of legend in her neck of the woods, as they say. She had the county in her pocket for years. The sheriff used to call her up every morning and give her the weather report and tell her how the chickens were laying. I can imagine her talking to the sheriff. Well, sheriff, I hope your mother gets better soon. I had a cold and a bad sore throat last week myself. I've still got the sniffles. Tell her hello for me and to drop by the next time she's down this way. And if you want that case, you can pick it up or I can have it sent over as soon as Jack gets back with the car. No, I don't know if I'm going to the fireman's ball this year, but you know that my heart is with the firemen. If you don't see me there tonight, you tell the boys that. No, I'll try to get there, but I'm still not fully recovered from my cold. It kind of climbs on me in the evening. My grandmother lived in a three-story house that was old even in those days. There was a pear tree in the front yard which was heavily eroded by rain from years of not having any lawn. The picket fence that once enclosed the lawn was gone too, and people just drove their cars right up to the porch. In the winter, the front yard was a mud hole, and in the summer, it was hard as a rock. Jack used to curse the front yard as if it were a living thing. He was the man who lived with my grandmother for 30 years. He was not my grandfather, but an Italian who came down the road one day selling lots in Florida. He was selling a vision of eternal oranges and sunshine door to door in a land where people ate apples and it rained a lot. Jack stopped at my grandmother's house to sell her a lot just a stone's throw from downtown Miami and he was delivering her whiskey a week later. He stayed for 30 years, and Florida went on without him. Jack hated the front yard because he thought it was against him. There had been a beautiful lawn there when Jack came along, but he let it wander off into nothing. He refused to water it or take care of it in any way. Now the ground was so hard that it gave his car flat tires in the summer. The yard was always finding a nail to put in one of his tires, or the car was always sinking out of sight in the winter when the rains came on. The lawn had belonged to my grandfather, who lived out the end of his life in an insane asylum. It had been his pride and joy, and was said to be the place where his powers came from. My grandfather was a minor Washington mystic, 
who in 1911 prophesied the exact date when World War I would start, June 28, 1914. But it had been too much for him. He never got to enjoy the fruit of his labor because they had to put him away in 1913, and he spent 17 years in the state insane asylum believing he was a child, and it was actually May 3rd, 1872. He believed that he was six years old and it was a cloudy day about to rain and his mother was baking a chocolate cake. It stayed May 3rd, 1872 for my grandfather until he died in 1930. It took 17 years for that chocolate cake to be baked. There was a photograph of my grandfather. I look a great deal like him. The only difference being that I am over six feet tall and he was not quite five feet tall. He had a dark idea that being so short, so close to the earth and his lawn would help to prophesy the exact date when World War I would start. It was a shame that the war started without him. If only he could have held back his childhood for another year, avoided that chocolate cake, all of his dreams would have come true. There were always two large dents in my grandmother's house that had never been repaired and one of them came about this way. In the autumn, the pears would get ripe on the tree in the front yard, and the pears would fall on the ground and rot, and bees would gather by the hundreds to swarm on them. The bees, somewhere along the line, had picked up the habit of stinging Jack two or three times a year. They would sting him in the most ingenious ways. Once a bee got in his wallet, and he went down to the store to buy some food for dinner not knowing the mischief that he carried in his pocket. He took out his wallet to pay for the food. That will be 72 cents, the grocer said. <coughs> Jack replied, looking down to see a bee busy stinging him on the little finger. The first large dent in the house was brought about by still another bee, landing on Jack's cigar as he was driving the car into the front yard that Perry autumn the stock market crashed. The bee ran down the cigar. Jack could only stare at it cross-eyed in terror and stung him on the upper lip. His reaction to this was to drive the car immediately into the house. That front yard had quite a history after Jack let the lawn go to hell. One day in 1932, Jack was off running an errand or delivering something for my grandmother. She wanted to dump the old mash and get a new batch going. Because Jack was gone, she decided to do it herself. Grandmother put on a pair of railroad overalls that she used for working around the still and filled a wheelbarrow with mash and dumped it out in the front yard. She had a flock of snow white geese that roamed outside the house and nested in the garage that had not been used to park the car since the time Jack had come along selling futures in Florida. Jack had some kind of idea that it was all wrong for a car to have a house. I think it was something that he learned in the old country. The answer was in Italian, because that was the only language Jack used when he talked about the garage. For everything else, he used English, but it was only Italian for the garage. After grandmother had dumped the mash on the ground near the pear tree, she went back to the still down in the basement and the geese gathered all around the mash and started talking it over. I guess they came to a mutually agreeable decision because they all started eating the mash. As they ate the mash, their eyes got brighter and brighter and their voices in appreciation of the mash got louder and louder. After a while, one of the geese stuck his head in the mash and forgot to take it out. Another one of the geese cackled madly and tried to stand on one leg and give a W.C. Fields imitation of a stork. He maintained that position for about a minute before he fell on his tail feathers. My grandmother found them all lying around the mash in the positions that they had fallen. They looked as if they had been machine gunned. From the height of her operatic splendor, she thought they were all dead. She responded to this by plucking all their feathers and piling their bald bodies in the wheelbarrow and wheeling them down to the basement. She had to make five trips to accommodate them. She stacked them like cordwood near the still and waited for Jack to return and dispose of them in a way that would provide a goose for dinner and a small profit by selling the rest of the flock in town. She went upstairs to take a nap after finishing with the still.
It was about an hour later that the geese woke up. They had devastating hangovers. They had all kind of gathered themselves uselessly to their feet when suddenly one of the geese noticed that he did not have any feathers. He informed the other geese of their condition too. They were all in despair. They paraded out of the basement in a forlorn and wobbly gang. They were all standing in a cluster near the pear tree when Jack drove into the front yard. The memory of the time he had been stung on the mouth by that bee must have come back to his mind when he saw the defeathered geese standing there because suddenly, like a madman, he tore out the cigar he had stuck in his mouth and threw it away from him as hard as he could. This caused his hand to travel through the windshield, a feat that cost him 32 stitches. The geese stood by, staring on like some helpless, primitive American advertisement for aspirin under the pear tree as Jack drove his car into the house for the second and last time in the 20th century. The first time I remember anything in life occurred in my grandmother's front yard. The year was either 1936 or 1937. I remember a man, probably Jack, cutting down the pear tree and soaking it with kerosene. It looked strange, even for a first memory of life, to watch a man pour gallons and gallons of kerosene all over a tree lying stretched out 30 feet or so on the ground and then to set fire to it while the fruit was still green on the branches. Whenever the telephone rings after 11 o'clock, I just uh, automatically assume that it's not going to be good news. I never, I never, I've never gotten any good news uh, from anyone after 11 o'clock or and, uh, up to about uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, so I just, uh, years and years of practice of, of answering the telephone at that uh, time of night, uh, bum trip after bum trip, now I just don't, I don't answer the telephone anymore. And uh, I have a switch here on the telephone where I can turn it off. and. Uh, it, uh, it will ring, but I won't hear it. And if I, if I want to assure my privacy absolutely, I just turn it, uh, I turn it off and no one can get through. Sometimes I'll do that, uh, for, like I'll be working on something and I won't want to talk to anyone, so I'll just turn off my telephone and it doesn't ring all day. It's a, it's a really incredible thing. It gives you control over the telephone. I'm, you know, I'm not a victim of it. Uh, like this. have him right here. Yes, okay. Sounds all right. Oh, let's see, $125. Mm -hmm. And when would the reading occur? Uh, let's see. Oh, thank you very, very much. Thank you. This is a group of love poems. The first one is called the She Never Takes Her Watch Off poem for Marcia. Because you always have a clock strapped to your body, it's natural that I should think of you as the correct time. 
with your long blonde hair at 8.03 and your pulse lightning breasts at 11.17 and your rose meow smile at 5.30, I know I'm right. The Double Bed Dream Gallows Driving through hot brushy country in the late autumn, I saw a hawk crucified on a barbed wire fence. I guess as a kind of advertisement to other hawks, saying from the pages of a leading women's magazine, she's beautiful, but burn all the maps to your body. I'm not here of my own choosing. November 3rd. I'm sitting in a cafe drinking a Coke. A fly is sleeping on a paper napkin. I have to wake him up so I can wipe my glasses. There's a pretty girl I want to look at. Flowers for those you love. Butcher, baker, candlestick maker. Anybody can get VD, including those you love. Please see a doctor if you think you've got it. You'll feel better afterwards, and so will those you love. I lie here in a strange girl's apartment. For Marcia. I lie here in a strange girl's apartment. She has poison oak, a bad sunburn, and is unhappy. She moves about the place like distant gestures of solemn glass. She opens and closes things. She turns the water on and she turns the water off. All the sounds she makes are far away. They could be in a different city. It is dusk and people are staring out the windows of that city. Their eyes are filled with the sounds of what she is doing. The Pill versus the Spring Hill Mine Disaster. When you take your pill, it's like a mine disaster. I think of all the people lost inside of you. Lovers. I changed her bedroom, raised the ceiling four feet, removed all of her things and the clutter of her life, painted the walls white, placed a fantastic calm in the room, a silence that almost had a scent, put her in a low brass bed with white satin covers, and I stood there in the doorway, watching her sleep, curled up with her face turned away from me. Gee, you're so beautiful that it's starting to rain. Oh, Marcia, I want your long blonde beauty to be taught in high school so kids will learn that God lives like music in the skin and sounds like a sunshine harpsichord. I want high school report cards to look like this. Playing with gentle glass things, A. Computer magic, A. Writing letters to those you love, A. Finding out about fish, A. Marcia's long blonde beauty, A+. Plus. I cannot answer you tonight in small portions. I cannot answer you tonight in small portions. Torn apart by stormy love's gate, I float like a phantom face down in a well where the cold dark water reflects vague half-built stars and trades all our affection, touching, sleeping together for tribunal distance, standing like a drowned train just beyond a pile of Eskimo skeletons the way she looks at it. Every time I see him, I think, gee, am I glad he's not my old man. A good talking candle. I had a good talking candle last night in my bedroom. I was very tired, but I wanted somebody to be with me. So I lit a candle and listened to its comfortable voice of light until I was asleep. I live in the 20th century, for Marcia. I live in the 20th century, and you lie here beside me. You were unhappy when you fell asleep. There was nothing I could do about it. I felt helpless. Your face is so beautiful that I cannot stop to describe it, and there's nothing I can do to make you happy while you sleep. This is a chapter from my novel, In Watermelon Sugar. The chapter is called, The Watermelon Sun. I woke up before Pauline and put on my overalls. A crack of gray sun shone through the window and lay quietly on the floor. I went over and put my foot in it, and then my foot was gray. 
I looked out the window and across the fields and piney woods and the town to the forgotten works. Everything was touched with gray, cattle grazing in the fields and the roofs of the shacks and the big piles in the forgotten works all looked like dust. The very air itself was gray. We have an interesting thing with the sun here. It shines a different color every day. No one knows why this is, not even Charlie. We grow the watermelons in different colors the best we can. This is how we do it. Seeds gathered from a gray watermelon, picked on a gray day, and then planted on a gray day will make more gray watermelons. It is really very simple. The colors of the days and the watermelons go like this. Monday, red watermelons. Tuesday, golden watermelons. Wednesday, gray watermelons. Thursday, black soundless watermelons. Friday, white watermelons. Saturday, blue watermelons. Sunday, brown watermelons. Today would be a day of gray watermelons. I like best tomorrow, the black soundless watermelon days. When you cut them, they make no noise and taste very sweet. They are very good for making things that have no sound. I remember there was a man who used to make clocks from the black soundless watermelons, and his clocks were silent. The man made six or seven of these clocks, and then he died. There is one of the clocks hanging over his grave. It is hanging from the branches of an apple tree and sways in the winds that go up and down the river. It, of course, does not keep time anymore. Pauline woke up while I was putting my shoes on. Hello, she said, rubbing her eyes. You're up. I wonder what time it is. It's about six. I have to cook breakfast this morning at Idef, she said. Come over here and give me a kiss, and then tell me what you would like for breakfast. Here are some more sounds of my life. Taking off my clothes. A bath, shaving. Brushing my teeth. Turning a light off. These are some short stories about California. This story is called A Short Story About Contemporary Life in California. There are thousands of stories with original beginnings. This is not one of them. I think the only way to start a story about contemporary life in California is to do it the way Jack London started The Sea Wolf. I have confidence in that beginning. It worked in 1904, and it can work in 1969. I believe that beginning can reach across the decades and serve the purpose of this story, because this is California. We can do anything we want to do. And a rich young literary critic is taking a ferry boat from Sausalito to San Francisco. He has just finished spending a few days at a friend's cabin in Mill Valley. The friend uses the cabin to read Schopenhauer and Nietzsche during the winter. They all have great times together. 
While traveling across the bay in the fog, he thinks about writing an essay called The Necessity for Freedom, a plea for the artist. Of course, Wolf Larsen torpedoes the ferry boat and captures the rich young literary critic who is changed instantly into a cabin boy and has to wear funny clothes and take a lot of shit off everybody, has great intellectual conversations with old Wolf, gets kicked in the ass, grabbed by the throat, promoted to mate, grows up, meets his true love Maud, escapes from Wolf, bounces around the damn Pacific Ocean in little better than a half-assed rowboat, finds an island, builds a stone hut, clubs seals, fixes a broken sailing ship, buries Wolf at sea, gets kissed, etc., all to end this story about contemporary life in California 65 years later. Thank God. This story is called The Memory of a Girl. I cannot look at the Fireman's Fund Insurance Company building without thinking of her breasts. The building is at Presidio and California Streets in San Francisco. It is a red brick, blue and glass building that looks like a minor philosophy plopped right down on the site of what was once one of California's most famous cemeteries. Laurel Hill Cemetery, 1854-1946. Eleven United States Senators were buried there. They and everybody else were moved out years ago but there are still some tall, dark cypress trees standing beside the insurance company. These trees once cast their shadows over graves. They were a part of daytime weeping and mourning and nighttime silence, except for the wind. I wonder if they asked themselves questions like, where did everybody go who was dead? Where did they take them? And where are those who came here to visit them? Why were we left behind? Perhaps these questions are too poetic. Maybe it would be best just to say, there are four trees standing beside an insurance company out in California. This story is called The View from the Dog Tower. Three German Shepherd puppies wandered away from their home up near the county line. North County Journal serving Northern Santa Cruz County. I've been thinking about this little item that I read in the North County Journal for a couple of months now. It contains the boundaries of a small tragedy. I know we are surrounded by so much blossoming horror in the world, Vietnam, starvation, rioting, living in hopeless fear, etc., that three puppies wandering off isn't very much, but I worry about it and see this simple event as the possible telescope for a larger agony. Three German Shepherd puppies wandered away from their home up near the county line. It sounds like something from a Bob Dylan song. Perhaps they vanished, playing, barking and chasing each other into the woods where lost they are to this very day, cringing around like scraps of dogs, looking for any small thing to eat, intellectually unable to comprehend what has happened to them because their brains are welted to their stomachs. Their voices are used now only to cry out in fear and hunger, and all their playing days are over, those days of careless pleasure that led them into the terrible woods. I fear that these three poor lost dogs may be the shadow of a future journey if we don't watch out. This story is called Pale Marble Movie. The room had a high Victorian ceiling, and there was a marble fireplace and an avocado tree growing in the window, and she lay beside me sleeping in a very well-built blonde way, and I was asleep too, and it was just starting to be dawn in September, 1964. Then suddenly, without any warning, she sat up in bed, waking me instantly, and she started to get out of bed. She was very serious about it. What are you doing, I said. Her eyes were wide open. I'm getting up, she said. They were a somnambulist blue. Get back in bed, I said. Why, she said, now halfway out of bed with one blonde foot touching the floor. Because you're still asleep, I said. Oh, okay, she said. That made sense to her. And she got back into bed and pulled the covers round herself and cuddled up close to me. She didn't say another word and she didn't move. She lay there sound asleep with her wanderings over and mine just beginning. I have been thinking about this simple event for years now. 
It stays with me and repeats itself over and over again like a pale marble movie. Boo forever. Spinning like a ghost on the bottom of a top, I'm haunted by all the space that I will live without you.